Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 15 through 23. And you'll notice this is a little different than the Matthew reading. I'll be preaching on the Luke text today, and then when Reverend Bonnie shares her message, that will be on the Matthew text. Let's open our hearts to what the Spirit is saying through these words today. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to Jesus, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. And at the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regards. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to try them out. Please accept my regards. Another said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were, who were invited will taste my dinner. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we can say, thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? God, in the reading of this word and in our gathering together, Inspire in us the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, your reign of grace and love, both here and now and forevermore. Guide us, Lord, by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. It is surprising how something as comforting as dinner could become so confrontational And that's how I would describe the dinner party where Jesus shares this dinner parable. Sharing a meal can be this wonderfully vulnerable thing. It can also be burdened with etiquette. Growing up, I was taught a few rules about dinner parties, and I'm I'm curious if you were taught the same thing. Some of the things I were taught were you don't show up empty-handed. You don't track in dirt into the host's house. You make sure to take your boots or shoes off at the door. No elbows on the table. Get your food last. Let everyone else go before you. Chew with your mouth closed, or better yet, if you feel you must, cover your mouth when you chew. Don't overstay your welcome, and help clean up your dishes when you're done if you can't do the dishes by yourself. You can imagine how relaxed I am at dinner parties with all these rules floating in my head. True story, I made a surprise visit to a friend in Georgia, and we went out to lunch together, and we ate, and we enjoyed each other's company, and we laughed, and when it came time to go, I asked for the check, and our server came to the table and very politely said, sir, there is no check, and I was so worried about burdening my friend with my part of the meal, who had stealthily paid for the lunch without me knowing, that I badgered the server, I said, please let me pay, you can't let him pay for my half, please take my credit card, please, won't you, won't you just pay, let me pay for my part? And finally my friend gently touched my shoulder and very sternly said, Will, I've got it, you can leave, I had to run on to my next engagement. I was so focused on following proper, proper protocol, on being a good dinner guest, that I failed to appreciate the gift of lunch with a friend. The late Sydney, Sir Sidney Poitier knew about confrontational dinner parties, or at least his character, Dr. John Prentice, uh, knew about it in the famed 1967 Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. The movie was a timely romantic comedy about a white woman named Joanna surprising her parents at dinner with her African-American fiancé, Dr. Prentice, Sidney Poitier's character. And one might imagine the excitement that two parents would have when their child has found love and decided to share this life with someone. But Joanna's parents throughout the film become more and more concerned with obstacles facing John and Joanna's relationship in the 1960s. They spend the dinner arguing and worrying rather than celebrating this love that her daughter and John have found together. 
Two weeks after Guess Who's Coming to Dinner finished filming, before it was released, the Supreme Court decided on Loving versus Virginia, and in that decision, they forbid any government from prohibiting interracial marriage. They saw that as unjust. The film was not just a comedy, but it was a statement about the unrestricted tables of love set before us and how our worldly commitments keep us from sitting at them. I hope when we hear this parable of the kingdom feast that the first thing we are is excited. That the kingdom of heaven is like a party that invites the poor and the forgotten and those who feel broken. Those on the highways, the byways, and the street side streets filled with the humblest and most unexpected guests. I hope that's our first inclination with this kingdom of heaven. But Jesus is also displaying some tongue-in-cheek humor in Luke. Jesus tells this story sitting at the table with Pharisees, religious and socially elite persons, and up to this point, he has watched the guest at this specific dinner party, refuse to heal a sick man because it's the Sabbath, and compete for honor amongst each other and about their seating arrangement. It sounds like a really fun crowd that gets consumed with law and order and seating arrangements at a party. In Jesus' story, the guests also exhibit a commitment to rule and order, but they use the rules to skip the feast rather than bring them out at the dinner. And now I can understand one of these excuses, but who turns down a dinner party to stare at a field or to inspect an oxen? Probably not someone with riveting conversation skills. These, these men are committed to their responsibilities in the world, but they are also committed to a narrow reading of the law. I imagine when Jesus told this parable, the Pharisees in the room where he was telling it remembered God's commandment in Deuteronomy 20, verses 5 through 8. It says, has anyone built a new house but not dedicated it? He should go back to his house. Has anyone planted a vineyard but not yet enjoyed its fruit? He should go back to his house. Has anyone become engaged to a woman but not yet married her? He should go back to his house. The irony of these commandments is that they weren't meant to be followed when they were written. Yahweh commands this as a way to wean from the Hebrew army those whose commitments lied elsewhere. These these were men prepared to take the promised land. And those commandments were given to soldiers And this scripture is about showing two things. One, that the people within this group are preoccupied with their own agenda sometimes, not God's. But the second thing was how God's power, not the power of man, would protect Judah. Maybe the three party poopers in our story felt that they were being obedient to this very narrow reading of Deuteronomy. When they really were showing what commitments they had elsewhere. Maybe Joanna's parents and guests who's coming to dinner were trying to remain supportive, but throughout the film and through the struggles show what commitments they had elsewhere. The parable of the great feast shows us how expansive the kingdom of God is, that those who aren't invited are brought in, that the farthest reaches are sought out, that the most unlikely guests are encouraged to come, but we should ask ourselves what Priorities deter us from joining the feast. Are we more committed to our work than to the feast of God? Is our commitment to things like order or decorum or respectability getting in the way of this incredible kingdom we've been invited to? Is our faith about order or is it about joy? Have we anchored ourselves to narrow religiosity where we reject the invitation to a kingdom filled with the joyful unworthy who are now called the beloved? Are we prepared to sit at a table of love that is radically set by the grace of Christ? In our lives and in our relationship to the kingdom of God, are we party poopers or are we party goers? And who would the party goers let sit at the table? I'll repeat that the kingdom of God sets a table of love that our worldly commitments struggle to let us appreciate. So the question is, when God sets the table, will we sit and enjoy the feast? 
or will we stay away? So now we'll hear from Reverend Bonnie Scott on the Matthew section of this text. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew in the 22nd chapter. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a visit with my parents over Christmas time, my dad said to me, what do I have to wear to your wedding? And my fiance and I looked at each other and said, um, a suit? And my dad leaned back in his recliner, the man wears slippers like 100% of the time and said, I don't have a suit. And knowing that money is not an issue, I said, well, you can get a suit. And then half jokingly, but half not jokingly, he said, can it be made out of flannel? No, dad, it cannot be made out of flannel. It was one of those conversations that really kind of struck a nerve and kind of lingered with me later because even if he meant it jokingly, which I'm not entirely sure he did, I was kind of like, dad, it's my wedding. Get a suit and stop being so half-hearted about it. The kingdom of God may be compared to a king throwing a wedding for his son and a series of invited guests who are even less, shall we say, enthralled about the ordeal than my dad. Now, in Luke's version of the story, which we just heard about from Will, it turns out to be kind of a charming story because even though all the originally invited guests were too busy with work and marriage and kids to show up, no problem, the host throws open the doors and includes all of the outcasts, a great social reversal takes place and the party is a hit. But in Matthew's gospel, the king's wedding invitations are rejected more than once. And the story is not at all charming, but actually becomes kind of macabre. First, the king's servants invite a round of guests who refuse. Then the servants invite another round of guests, and the invited guests begin to murder the servants. And so the king gets angry and destroys the people who rejected his invitation and his servants. All of this vengeance and murder over some rejected party invitations? You might be thinking, this is not actually a story about a wedding. This is about something deeper than that. And you would be right. We are not in Matthew chapter 13 anymore. We are in Matthew 22. We're getting a heck of a lot closer to Jesus's crucifixion. Gone are the sweet parables about treasures in fields and yeast in bread. Now we're getting clues that something terrible is going to happen. Jesus himself is going to be rejected 
in a rather macabre sort of way. And just as Jesus is rejected, so too is the kingdom of heaven rejected, day after day, all around us. Now, at the end of this parable, even after all the murder and violence, the king still manages to throw a wedding for his son, and he still manages to fill the room with guests. But while going through the ballroom, he discovers a guest who is not wearing the proper wedding attire. Shall we say he's wearing flannel? Oh, don't worry, it's not the money here. Guests would have had access to the proper wedding robes with their invitation. This is a guy showing up in a flannel suit, intentionally leaving his black tie at home. And the king goes up to him and says, friend. But this word in the gospel has a negative connotation. It, more mean, it means more like buster. The king says to him, buster, how did you get in here without proper attire? And the king then throws him out, not just out of the party, but out into the outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. If you're thinking, this is not actually a story about a dad wearing the wrong clothes to a wedding, this is about something deeper, then you would be right. We know what it is like for someone to show up in a place meant for good, but not to come with the right spirit. I was thinking about the rabbi in a synagogue recently who literally opened the door to a man inviting him into the sanctuary to pray and the man turned the synagogue into a prison taking hostage of the congregants for hours and hours. Buster, how did you get in here without a right spirit? And I was thinking about Magruder High School, a place for children for education and learning. And someone came to school and turned it into a crime scene. Buster, how did you get in here without the right spirit? And I was thinking about the gun that that student used called a ghost gun, because without sufficient government regulation, you can buy the parts online and put them together like a science project and have a lethal weapon in your backpack. Buster, how did you get in here? What we thought was going to be the flawless inauguration of the kingdom of God, a, a heavenly banquet of love and justice and mercy only on this side of heaven, turns out to be a tragedy. We know this parable all too well. We would really love to just have Luke's version, but instead we're stuck with Matthew's too. Now, I wonder, where is the good news in this parable? I wonder if the good news in this parable is the figure of God who will not allow evil to run rampant in her parties, but like a bouncer on a mission will oust every form of oppression, injustice, or violence. I wonder if the good news is Christ often called the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected, will not allow this rejection to thwart his commitment to us in the coming kingdom of God. I wonder if the good news in this parable is actually an invitation to any one of us who considers ourselves a member of the kingdom of God, a subject of the kingdom of God, to ask ourselves, Buster, am I wearing the right garments? Am I wearing the right spirit? Am I showing up to this world clothed in compassion and kindness and justice of God? Or am I half-hearting it most of the time? Just showing up for the free food, but uninterested in conforming my life to the kingdom of justice and peace. This parable points undeniably to the crucifixion, but every parable that points to the crucifixion also points to the resurrection, the unexpected, unforeseen, ultimate rejection of evil itself. Bye-bye, Buster.